We are here today joined by Carlos del Clos, who is a Pompeu Fabra University sociologist, an author and a member of Roar magazine. He has written four publications, such as the New York Times and Jacobin. Carlos, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Dia. Um, update on the bio, I'm a, I'm a sociologist at the UAB, the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, no worries. I, I've got my PhD UAB. at the UAB. <laughs> update. You are joining us from Barcelona, right? You are both in the same place. That's right. That's right. From Friendly Sants, Barcelona. Many of you will have heard about the anti-tourism protests that have been going on in a quite a... Um, a remarkably strong and loud way. Often these protests have been tied to housing issues. They've been taken on by renters groups. Is tourism really the root of the problem though? Uh, or is it exposing deeper issues such as the privatization of housing and the lack of industrial development in uh, uh, Southern Europe? Oh, I think that's a very good question, uh, Tiare. Uh, I think tourism is a very, very, I'll, I'll say it's a, it's a very bad symptom of a much deeper problem. It's almost redundant to speak of tourism and global capitalism because what is global capital but touristic? It's about deploying in strategic places and, you know, extracting resources from those places and you know, uh, in, imposing its order on all of life, including human social life uh, in those areas. So, so I don't view them as very different things. In Spain's case, tourism, is, what, is, what is it a symptom of? Well, I think it's a symptom of one of the things that you talked about, which is uh, sort of the lack of industrial development or the deindustrialization that's been going on in Spain since the 1980s and its entry into the European Union and its sort of structural position as a sort of tertiary sort of uh, sector area for the the rest of the EU as sort of, you know, much of Southern Europe is. Um, however, I think there's a much older logic at play, which has to do with Spain's sort of longer, much longer, much deeper history as a landed aristocracy, as a country that sort of went from an agricultural economy with landed aristocrats who were, you know, in cahoots, in cahoots with uh, the monarchy and uh, the church and these sort of uh, powers. I mean, that is the root of the Spanish state is, you know, this pact between uh, bar barbaric Christian you know, local lords uh, around these these crowns and uh, with the racist agenda of expelling uh, Muslims and Jews and imposing, you know, a national Catholic order on uh, on indigenous people in the Americas and worldwide. So so that's all there, certainly. Uh, but the lack of a productive economy has kind of made Spain this place where, you know, it's a great piece of land. It's a beautiful piece of land. It's a small piece of land, smaller than my own home state, but very diverse. It has a lot of what you can, you know, what you might be looking for. It has beautiful green mountains. It has beaches. It has, you know, desert if you want. Uh, it's got a lot going for it. Um, it's a nice plot of land. Uh, and land is uh, very much, you know, it's its most uh, compelling resource. Uh, it's also, you know, a borderland in a sense. Uh, so it's strategically quite important, geopolitically and all this. And so, you know, what I think has happened is absent industrial uh, production, absent a, a real economic vision. The only economic vision in town was urban development oriented towards attracting foreign investment capital in the form of vacation homes, um, you know, resorts, golf courses, things like that. This is what it's developed. Now, actually, you know, for, for a book I'm writing right now, I'm reading, I've gone back to uh, the book by by Rafael Chirves Crematorio, uh, which is excellent, which is all about this. Um, it's all about, you know, sort of the rapid class mobility uh, that a lot of people experienced, you know, in the, during the, the boom in the real estate uh sector in the late 1990s and early 2000s, where through kind of murky means, they, uh, you know, and, and 
a lot of legal engineering by the the conservative party. They they made land, you know, urbanizable was the term that they ter- they used here, and just you know absolutely did away with uh, Roman ruins and mass graves from the Civil War. You know, all this kind of stuff. It, it's very symbolic and it's very and it speaks a lot to this. Uh, but this is what the Spanish economy was was really based on, and I think it has to do, yeah, on the one hand with a vision of uh, urban development and regional development that was very much oriented around this, uh, but it's also very much oriented towards attract, attracting foreign capital and and laying the groundwork, the legal ground groundwork to make this an attractive place to vacation and to you know have a good time and all this stuff. But this was very manufactured, and this has been manufactured since since. Franco's so-called economic miracle. I mean, he's went by the hand. Industrial development in Spain has always been, at least in my lifetime, not, not always, always, but in my lifetime, it's been very oriented around construction and not just the construction of housing, but the construction of large cultural centers like the Guggenheim. Barcelona has at least seven contemporary art museums. You know, they're all good, but, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, I, I, I've always said that Spain had uh, in my book, uh, Hope is a Promise, uh, I talked about Spain having what I called the the Field of Dreams Syndrome, which is a terrible Kevin Costner movie, where a cornfield says, If you build, you will come. And this was very much what, what Spain's economic development model was about. It wasn't about, for instance, you know, oh, we want culture, you know, we want to be a cultural capital of the world and let's fund the arts, let's fund culture. It was, let's build a cultural center and then the, the, the artists will come. Well, this is kind of a very indirect and roundabout way of doing it, but it has the trade-off that it does create a lot of quote unquote, semi-skilled labor uh, that you don't need a college degree to do. And that for a long time was quite lucrative. So, so we need to get into all of these topics when we, when we think about what's going on in the tourism sector. And I do think that it, that topic has been simplified to some extent around this figure of expats versus tourists and just kind of, you know, trying to find some really not that powerful figure to orient your kind of politics around and elaborate some kind of coalition to reaffirm local control, which is what everybody's kind of ultimately demanding uh, as a capacity to for the local populations to define their destiny, subjecting it to the whims of capital is, is, is very, uh, you know, it creates a lot of precarity and uncertainty. Um, and people, you know, want, I think more, more, more control over that. But, uh, I don't think this is the way to go because usually the problem is the local elites, right? The local elites are the ones that have forever sold pieces of Spain to whoever, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, definitely been simplified to an extreme. And also, do you find that it's been individualized, personified in sort of the tourists themselves? That worries me because I understand the annoyance, right? Uh, I think you feel that too, probably. I understand when you live in one place, it can be you know, pretty, yeah, annoying to to be moving around all day, having to commute to work for quite um, quite long periods of time. And meanwhile, the center is filled with uh, touristic venues where people can just like wake up in the morning and be in the middle of everything. They can just walk everywhere. Um, and while that can be very annoying, paid holiday leave was something that we as a workers movement really had to fight for and that these people have a right to. So I don't know, spraying them in the face with water um, and literally, quite literally telling them to go away, that they're not welcome. Are there things, specific uh, actions or different ways of organizing or even within our organizations, right? Uh, renters unions, etc. Are there maybe other ways that this energy might be redirected that you think are more productive and yeah, more pragmatically effective. Led. Perhaps. What's at the root of any conflict between tourist and local is uh, the use of the city. So one of the things that's very, anno- like, let's just kind of think sociologically about like what's annoying about a tourist. What's annoying about a tourist is that they're on vacation and they're using your city 
to play. They they're they're using it in a in a, in a playful way, which is how you would like to be using your city if you didn't have to fucking go to work, right? <laughs> um, and that's very annoying. It's very annoying to get on the train at rush hour, come back from a long day at work, and just hire this you know people that are coming back from the beach. It's just it feels awful. And to have that year round, it's like who are these people that have you know these vacations? And, and it's very difficult to build solidarity on that because it's, it's just very different than your life. Right. So that's kind of like the use of, of, of the city it, it, that you can kind of just perceive just from your own, you know, phenomenological sort of take on things. Right. But at the same time, I think people are very conscious of what tourism gentrification actually is. Right. Uh, tourism gentrification, uh, Kevin Fox Gotham, I think is his name, uh, talked about this and and sort of the post Katrina US. Um, but the idea is basically that you know when gentrification is taking place, not when there's you know cupcake stores or uh, you know specialty coffee places. That's not gentrification. Like that's that's pretty late in the process, right? But one of the things that you can really notice or when, when you really start to see things turn is when the use of the built environment and very particularly the commercial infrastructure and the residential infrastructure becomes oriented towards the use of non-residents. And in the housing market, this is particularly noxious as a dynamic because Spain has lower salaries than a lot of the countries where tourists are coming from. And, you know, they just can't compete uh, in a, in a non-regulated private rental market, which is the main form of, of, of rental housing, or even just market rate housing, even purchased housing is now being, you know, scooped up by, by folks with second residences. But, you know, Spaniards participate in this quite a bit as well. I mean, what I mean is not just by being tourists in other places and being boisterous tourists, tourists and very noticeable tourists in other places, but also by being uh, tourists within their own country. Uh, Spain is a very high percentage of people with second residences and second residences that they're not necessarily leasing out or renting out. It's just, you know, like a center pueblo, it's their, it's their home. You know, there was, this is the legacy of, of very large scale rural to urban migration is that a lot of people that live in the city have a pueblo that they're originally from. They maintain a house to have some roots and all this kind of stuff, but they know that when they go back to those towns, they are the sort of, you know, cosmopolitan, uh, figure, right. Um, so I actually think that the tourism protests in Spain have been a lot less problematic than they could have been. And, th and these are not the first, this is not the first time that this has happened by any means. I mean, there were large uh, protests against tourism in Barcelona in 2013, 2014, uh, because of the behavior of the tourists, which gets framed as uncivil uh, and all this kind of shit, which is a very reactionary framework. But at the same time, if you go to those protests, you're going to find a lot of people, right, locals, but a lot of their demands sometimes are very cool and very like left wing and you know, I'm down. Uh, but a lot of the times it's that they don't want Pakistani street uh, vendors selling beer, you know, like uh, th this kind of thing really, you know, bothers them. Or sometimes it turns on street vendors of, of all kinds. This is sort of the, the double-edged sword with with tourism that I think people want you to be like, really conscious of. The tendency has been very good about this for the most part. But they still fall into, you know, expats versus locals sometimes. And this is not particularly helpful. It's not that it's not true. <laughs> it's just not the biggest piece of the pie. I mean, who's selling this? You know, we need to talk about hedge funds, but not just hedge funds. We talk about what, how people are screwing everybody else over to, to scratch a little bit for themselves. And, and I think this is, a, this is a big, this is a big problem with capitalism, right? Is that it, it permeates everything and it permeates your behaviors and it creates this everybody against everybody type of dynamic. Or it's really hard to point to like a large scale actor that's that's particularly bad. At the same time, tourism, because it can be very cap capital intensive if you're starting a project, but it also it orients so much of the Spanish economy, and it's so important as a pillar of the Spanish economy that not just large corporations, but the state itself participates in creating, you know, a very large marketing operation to attract tourists. And that's that's very difficult to reach. So what do neighbors do? Well, they take a direct action approach and they sabotage the reputation. You can have a, tons of large scale tourist protests, but, um, and there were like that there were 
what I liked about this last wave of tourist mobilizations was that they were in places that were not Barcelona um, at first. So it was the Canary Islands. It's uh, Malaga, even, I think. Uh, it's uh, the the Balearic Islands. It's like, it's about time, right? Um, and this is a long time coming. But Barcelona makes the news and frames it and creates an international story the moment that citizens spray uh, tourists with water and and it's 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 a very it's like a dumb silly little like action but this is the way capital works right um this is the semiotic part of capitalism where you know you really sabotage the capacity to to sell the ideas like yeah you can just come here everybody loves it you're gonna have a great time it's like no man people are pissed off because i i say this myself as someone who's being priced out of my neighborhood where i've lived for the last decade because i can't pay for it and then me and my family of three we can't we can't you can't afford, you know, I'm a university, university professor. I can't pay for a working class neighborhood in Barcelona. And, and it sucks. And, and, and it's very tangibly because of the proliferation of Airbnbs and, and really bad uh, housing policy. And yeah, popular discontent, it can be pretty messy. And I think that they've done a good job of framing it in a way that's properly anti-capitalist for the most part, for the most part. But they're walking a very thin line. A uh, very, very, a very, very tight rope, so to speak. Well, I'm mixing metaphors. <laughs> it's uh, definitely not easy to find a sort of reasonable balance, I guess, especially when emotions are quite tense. I would say you also uh, brought up, you know, xenophobia and kind of like the lightly hidden role of that because you know since it's leftist organization then you organizations then you don't expect that to be a, an issue which i think it certainly is right i was wondering how do you see that reflected if at all in spain's relationship with the european union Wrong. what's the connection to migration are spanish leftist parties um skeptical enough of the European Union. From about 2011 to 2014, we had a very clear position that was not necessarily like Eurosceptic or whatever, but it was, well, it was properly skeptical of the EU's intentions because it was so obvious that this is Spain's place in the European division, the EU's division of labor. People work other places, they have nice lives other places, they have proper functioning well state wet welfare states in other places. And then in Spain, you go and you have a good time and people are waiters and they'll serve you. And, um, you know, they devalue their own workers and they're precarious and who cares? They'll have 28% unemployment and, you know, uh, they'll just deal with it, you know? So I think that's very much a part of it. Uh, and I think that was present. I think that's gone now. Certainly the, whatever is left of that wave, which is over. But uh, the sort of torchbearers of, of those movements have gone very much into a pro-EU position that's very often uncritical. Very much has to do with the substantial amount of money that EU, the EU has dumped into Spain after COVID or during and after COVID. And because Pedro Sánchez is positioning himself as a European leader. But I do think that there is resentment, certainly, at, at this sort of you know, this position in the European division of labor that, 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 that the EU, that, that Spain occupies within the EU. In terms of the, of xenophobia, you know, it's interesting because I see a lot of discourse and, you know, it's fine. It's good. The, the, the left, like the, the leftist organizations such as the tenants union, noteworthy people in the left wing parties, unions of various types will always make this point of like, oh, so you have no problem you know, bring in Saudi money, you know, rich Saudis here to buy up large plots of land, but you have a problem with the guys coming in on the boats. Give me a break. You know, like they're good on that, but there is very much like every time I hear people talk about this, it's like they still frame it in terms of like, oh, these freaking Anglo tourists or these German tourists and this kind of stuff. It's like as a person who's, you know, like uh, some kind of mixed identity or whatever, um, well, as they're that privilege, if you will, Hate the discourse and privileges, but uh, in any case, <laughs> the but but as someone who's who's from that position, I, I'll just hear that and I'll just be like, "Man, you're just you really want to be racist, don't you?" Like, because you, you still think like that, you still think in blocks, right? In this way, and you just want to do, you just want to have someone that you can make that that 
anti-woke joke about. And it's like, you know, uh, you can say stuff that it, it'll be funny, you know, but that shouldn't be your political position, <laughs> you know? Like, you shouldn't articulate a whole position around this. There'd be some funny nonsense to say at a bar, you know? Um, but but the, you, you can't build a common space. Uh, or, or the common space you can build from there is garbage. I don't know any other way to really frame that. Yeah, no, I, it, uh, it is. <laughs> it absolutely is. And actually, since we are on garbage issues, Suman, which I remember we discussed together on the Sobremesa podcast. Oh, yeah. Which is a great podcast, by the way. Everyone should yeah, everyone should check out Sobremesa. Yeah, they're great. And basically, I remember, you know, we were discussing this and we were, I mean, I was excited. I think you kind of were too, right? Like it was a project that had certainly potential, especially because it came from Yolanda Diaz, uh, who has been certainly an interesting figure on the left. And she's done some pretty uh, remarkable stuff uh, in terms of her labor policy. And Suman began as a blend between being labor focused and green politics. Its direction ended up aligning more, I think, with the green side of it. How do you regard that, right? Like, do you think, actually, no, it's, it's gone more on a working class-based politics direction or with the more sort of professional managerial class politics of typical European greens? And how does that fit with the figure of uh, Yolanda Diaz. Mm. I don't think they've gone in any direction. <laughs> like that's that's kind of the thing. That's their problem is they've gone in no direction. Diaz is certainly in, a very interesting figure, a very capable person, very impressive person, uh, an excellent uh, labor minister, atrocious par party leader, absolutely terrible. Uh, and there's just no there's no there there. Yolanda Diaz for many years was the part of the communist party or the united left that understood 15 she understood it she was open to it she was the smartest part of a dying system and the best part of a dying system which is the it's the opposition to the system right like someone who actually truly wants to transform it from within whatever you want to call it but you know i i'm i'm, I'm very impressed with this person i think she's a fantastic labor minister but there was no real effort, I don't know about effort, but, but they were not successful in actually dealing with the problems of the political space that they were supposed to deal with. I don't recall how I was on the Sura Mesa podcast, but um, enthusiasm is not something that I've faced party politics with in many, many, many years. I never liked party, uh, party politics. Um, I, I've only kind of been very vocal in my support of the municipalist wave, which also kind of I mean, I like it, but it kind of disappointed me pretty early on because I mean, of a more Bookchinite, Murray Bookchin style libertarian municipalism than ultimately what happened, right? But I, but I was certainly, you know, it's, that's who I was going to vote for was either Smart or Podemos, one of, one of those two. And, um, and I thought I was being smarter in a lot of ways uh, at the time, but, but I don't think they, they dealt with the problems of Podemos, which were a lack of internal democracy a capacity to develop newer, new generations of, of leadership, a capacity to work with the social movements in a way that didn't try to hegemonize the social movements, that didn't treat them as a sort of franchise, but existed within that tension. And I think that, you know, which direction have they gone? I think that they just, they haven't gone any direction. I mean, they, they did this sort of like, if I had to describe the direction as just, just words, I've always had a problem with the discursive left. Like, I think we can't, I think their problem is a problem that we've been stuck in for many years. And I think the route of representation coming from a no, not represent on, no one represents us, I mean, we'll represent, as we said in Catalan, that perspective, it was a decision to, to make the jump to representation. It was a contradiction. But part of that jump was to just go straight into the world of discourse as opposed to innovative practices, disruptive practices, a new another institutionality that can kind of 
work with the outside and build something autonomous and something truly different. When you're so focused on discourse, it's very difficult to live up to the hype. The problem is that, you know, you you, you play with the, the politics of hope and all this stuff, which is about generating new desires that you will ultimately frustrate because the institutionality is the one that it is. And in, this, in the gap between the enthusiasm, the hype, the hope, and the reality on the ground, which are gradual sort of improvements, you might have shot your wad a little bit uh, by over uh, representing what you're actually doing or like exaggerating what you're actually doing. It's awesome that like former squatters became mayors of cities uh, and then that their greatest legacy is what, like bike lanes, semi-pedestrian streets. You know what I mean? To me, the, the best thing that um, the best things that have happened since Spain has had a left wing government have been. Raising the minimum wage about 40%. We were at 735 euros a month, and that's now 1100. That's dealing with the biggest sort of problem in Spain, which is the, 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 the bottom 20%. I mean, we, we, you cannot deny that that's just a good move. I like that they were kind of bold in some issues involving, for instance, like minimum income schemes, which are really poorly implemented, but, but, but it's a groundwork and it's a frame that, that you can work with. I like that. The labor reform, which uh, made indefinite contracts sort of the default position, which gave a lot of people a lot more stability. Employment has been better. They've been Keynesian and smart about economic investment. Their handling of the pandemic, I think, was quite good for the most part. It's, it's the country that seems to be doing the best. And, and it was one of the first hit and one of the hardest hit. So, you know, it's not easy, but, but they did some really good things that we all to kind of take for granted now. But the thing is, why do we take it for granted? Well, because we expected really big things from a party led by Pablo Iglesias or from a party led by Yolanda Díaz. Most of those achievements are Yolanda Díaz, you know, being a smart policy person and Pablo Iglesias being an audacious political leader. It just sucks that they are uh, so toxic in this time, well, especially Pablo. I wouldn't say Yolanda is necessarily toxic as a party year, but Pablo, the political culture, let's say, in this political space is atrocious. I wouldn't put it all on Pablo by any means, as we've seen in recent days, uh, but it's certainly been a problem that they have not resolved. My hope uh, when Sumar came to be, it was for it to differentiate itself, both from the left of the 90s, sort of post-politics, this total hopelessness, and also from the anti-politics of populism of parties like Podemos, which ended up having a whole other range of problems, but basically, yeah, like we went from the end of history to the end of the end of history, but did we go back to history? You know what I mean? Mm. I don't really see that uh, things ever really took off in the sense of working class organization, of real antagonism. Do you basically regard Sumar as having fallen into that exact same sort of inertia as Podemos, as mm. Mas Madrid, which is uh, Errejón's uh, regional Madrid party, did like do you think this is the same direction and you know how do we avoid mm. falling into that trap again well i think to design policy the people that design policy uh, can either be lobbyists or they can be left-wing sort of professionals uh by professionals i mean honestly university professors and uh, and people like that or people that are in think tanks or whatever. You know, someone's got to design policy and, and things like the housing law were done, for instance, in consultation with organizations like the, the Observatorio Desk, right? Um, which are, you know, NGOs that have that have a foot in that have had foot feet in the streets. It's with the tenants unions in some cases, but but in tension with them and and usually kind of like treating their participation more as a legitimizing factor for a bunch of decisions that were taken to assuage the concerns of uh, much more powerful actors, you know. The best way I can say it is I think that they did an okay job of creating a seat at the table for actors that come from these, you know, more interesting to me political spaces, uh, but they didn't do a very good job of putting a fist on the table and uh, supporting them. Uh, you know, they, they try to do this thing where it's like, well, we'll just bring you together 
and you know we'll kind of mediate and this sort of thing and well, it's that's bullshit because uh you are part of the state apparatus the difference uh, ultimately between like a multinational corporation and like a state or whatever is that you can vote in a state presumably <laughs> right like you can't really vote in much many ways with a multinational corporation unless you have a large trade union for instance i i would have liked to have seen much more effort geared towards the labor movement and strengthening the labor movement from these positions than i've seen i mean i've, I've seen them more as like well you know we're we're going to bring that. I mean, that was beyond the this whole thing. She was really good at it, I have to say, but she would always be like, well, we brought the chamber of commerce or the patronal together with the, the trade unions and we've reached, you know, social dialogue and so on. And we've reached these agreements and all that stuff. And it's been great for that, I guess, but it's, but it's still social dialogue to mask social conflict. And, uh, I would have preferred to see, I like Podemos more on this front, that they're much more willing to bring the conflict. And I think Sumar lost that. They lost the, 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 the capacity to be conflictual. It was precisely their raison d'etre in a way. It was like, well, you we don't want these loud, noisy uh, Podemos ministers because they bring negative press. You know, and that's really come back to bite them because now they have negative press and a problem of legitimacy, uh, of credibility as, um, as a left-wing project, as a, as a successful or an antagonistic left-wing project. While Yolanda Diaz did a remarkable work during her first time, her first months in government, the latter part of her position in government hasn't been as good at all. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just, you know, no, no comparison, I, I believe. And that's been when she's been within her own new party, right, mm -hmm. Sumar? Mm -hmm. So seems to have been counterproductive. Yeah, Let I think, I, no, I think one of the things that that's sort of happened there is that they do have a problem with the type of majority that they have. I, I, I don't want to downplay that because they now they, there's not a left wing majority in Spain at the moment. We have a left wing government, but not a left wing majority. Why? Because the left wing government depends on support from the right wing uh, Basque nationalists and Catalan nationalists who are, who are right wing. Like they're conservative. And so the trade-offs that those parties are going to be willing to accept in order to sort of work the direction of dealing with the territorial crisis, I think is always going to be hard. And in fact, I mean, I think that like, I personally, with the second legislature, I did not have any hopes for a lot of progress on the left-wing social policy front. Um, I had, a, I felt like they were probably going to be able to like iron out some problems with the ingreso minimo vital, the minimum income schemes and little, little policy things like that. But I thought this would be the legislature to really focus on, on the territorial problem for better or worse. But that just needs to, that, that's a can of worms that needs to be closed at some point. And I think that I thought that they would be dealing a little bit more with that, but you know, they've been so mired in scandal. A lot of it just been sort of drummed up nonsense, like the big Oña Gomez uh, cases or, you know, just the standard kind of creepy corruption cases so that they've had a, a kind of a difficult time of uh, actually being able to set the agenda. But I don't think they've set it in either direction, right? So I don't think they really set it in the direction of like Catalonia and the Basque region and the territorial issues, which are not just in those regions, right? Like the the, the domination of Madrid over the rest of Spain is, is, a, is an issue. It's an issue, I think, actually even at the heart of left-wing politics here. It's like Madrid's just too important overrepresented uh, in a lot of ways. And it would be a good time to to deal with that. And I think you could do interesting things with that uh, and they're just not doing it. So yeah, it's just kind of ineffectual on a lot of fronts. At the same time as it's, you know, keeping us from getting worse, I guess, uh, on some level. I mean, that's ultimately, it's a defensive sort of legislature. They've been on the defensive from day one. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do see that difference too. Like I was saying, like between the first legislature, which was just more exciting, uh, and the second one has just been a lot of being on the defensive, which <laughs> takes us to... The question of Inu Errejón, one of the biggest uh, politicians, left politicians in Spain, who has recently been under very heavy uh, accusations of sexual misconduct, which have cast a shadow over Sumar, of course, the party that he was now a part of. Accusations of bad behavior, which can be qualified commonly as 
five boy behavior yeah. uh, have been blended, have been mixed with accusations of criminal uh, sexual misconduct. And I find that blend, that sort of analysis that is being made by leftist or, you know, suppose it leftist, uh, a lot of feminists, I find that very concerning. We just wanted to know what mm -hmm. you think this means, how you regard that sort of analysis, of course, and also what this means politically, right? Like, what does it mean specifically for Sumar, but also for Podemos, which has been its rival? What's going on? What What is going to happen? I've, I've experienced a lot of emotions over the last few days. Um, the dominant one has been sadness, a lot of sadness. Sadness is uh, it's not a mobilizing emotion by any means. And then outrage uh, on some level. My outrage... My outrage has more to do with sort of abuse of power that was kind of a powerful position, even if it's just a symbolic power position, because I mean, the guy didn't have a lot of seats in parliament or a particularly strong position in the party, frankly. Uh, but he's a generational figure. He's a generational figure who, you know, built himself as something and ended up being something else, which not to be a dick, but with representation, like that's kind of the story is that you're not you, you, you represent something else. And that's part of the problem with it for those of us who come from another political tradition. It does it is hostile to that. And they were more about direct democracy, right? It's been sad and outrageous of just like, you know, he's so irresponsible. A lot of it has to do with sexual tastes and this kind of thing, which like, you know, I hate that discussion, you know? Like, I, I personally kind of feel like there's a reaction that I genuinely hate to all of this, which is from men, leftist men, which is just like, oh my God, we men are the worst. God, I, I'm so sorry for all of this. It's like, man, speak for yourself. <laughs> Don't bring me into this shit. I didn't fucking do anything with that, you know? And whatever, people like whatever they want to like. But I think there's a generational issue, first off, that that's important to think about. Um, and we can get to that in a moment. But I think that on the other hand, it's like, I don't know. I have a mix of like really messed up jokes that I deal with all of this with. Does gallows humor a little bit? I really dislike the sort of puritanical discourse about other people's sex lives. It's none of anyone's business. I think a lot of what's being published is like for the motorball, for the sort of sordid details. And like, I think it's a lot of it reads as like erotic nonfiction, uh, which is which is really lame it, in the way that it's treated, not in the testimonies of the women themselves. The testimonies of the women themselves are, I don't think those are to be questioned. I just think that everybody's reaction to it is really a problem. You know, um, and he was such an important generational figure that it, it it reflects poorly on a lot of people. But the worst thing about it is the political culture around it, right? Like the political culture of not actually developing proper channels uh, within the party to, to deal with these kinds of issues, to guarantee accountability. I also think that just like the handling of it publicly has been horrible. There's been a lot of criticizing, you know, the not just the sexual practices, but the fact that he uses uh, drugs, you know, it's like, I'm so <laughs> it's like it's none of my business like i'm actually pro legalization of everything so you can go ahead and you know so you can keep your sanctimony um about that kind of stuff that said i mean you know cokehead uh representative is a different vibe than a lot of other different types of drug users i just want to throw that out there um but uh but yeah i don't know i think it's 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 just very sad like to see the whole reaction to it and that it's so damaging and that it invalidates a, a political generation but then but then thinking about that generational aspect too is i think really important because these are younger women that he's that he's messing around with uh in a lot of cases and um inigo is and a lot of these representatives they're they're, they're from my sort of zenial uh gen x millennial uh generation where we were politicized in the late nineties, early two thousands. And we, a lot of us come from counter hegemonic, uh, movements like anti-systemic movements in a lot of cases, uh, anti-globalization where we're challenging all of the global social order. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and we don't, we didn't have any real pretenses to like be the mainstream, you know what I mean? We wanted to push the mainstream in a different way, but we didn't want to be it. But in the moment that a lot of these guys make the jump to politics, uh, they make the jump into like normie politics. And that jump into normie politics from this countercultural position is like, it's going to create all these types of 
frictions. And so the new generations that uh, kind of latch on to this and get interested because of the political cult parties and not because of the kind of street oriented uh, people. You know, it's a different set. Like they're they're more mainstream than the street people. So you read is a little weird if you propose yourself like that to 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 folks. And then and then some of that stuff, like from what I've read, is inexcusable, right? Like it's just kind of like it's just an abuse of power, just being like a fucking jerk, um, you know. And 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 it's, it's a problem. I think a lot of the reaction, which is what I'm talking about, is like, oh my god, you know, these sordid details and this kind of stuff. Like, oh Jesus Christ, man, you know, a sex positive left is not the dominant left, and the problem is in a lot of ways that when we're attached to the normie left it kind of validates the most extreme right-wing criticism of the center left is going you know being weird uh you know into into sadomasochism and all this i mean it's very different to be into leather daddy shit than it is into being epstein you know <laughs> but 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 it, it, it kind of resonates with 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 very more moralistic and puritanical kind of like sensibilities. I don't think we, you know, I don't think it's good to to to, to placate that. Um, and I don't like that. That's kind of what I'm saying. I don't know if uh, I, what I'm saying is awful or not. And if it is, I, I hope no. not. I, I think what's awful is the reaction that we're seeing. Obviously, Rejon's actions. I mean, of course, uh, there is cause, cause for concern. 100%. The thing is, they are creating a problem on top of the problem. And I think the puritanism is a big part of it. And I mean, we could, honestly, uh, this does deserve a whole podcast or, or more than one because it's extremely complex. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's probably partly academic, I would say. It's not, uh, I, I wouldn't think this is the, the core, this needs to be the core of our politics. Obviously, though, this is very pressing uh, these days in Spain and has been for a while. And, you know, I do think it's part of a left that is based on this creation of victims that are ultimately objects and that denies the people who need politics the most the possibility to be subjects and to have that agency. And, yeah, it's just looking for victims. And women, in this case, are the perfect victims and I mean why else feel everything with these sordid details which taste so puritanical and sometimes these descriptions are of behaviors that are so normal it's like come on man like y'all all read 50 shades of gray the thing it's shocking that they see some of these things some of these things as shocking yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the, I haven't read all of the how alert they are. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of what I've read is pretty gross, though. Like, of just like yeah, yeah, indeed. Come on, man. But some of it is, you know. But that's the thing. It's like it's just it's it's exactly. all just like garbage in, garbage out. It's just sad in Spanish politics right now uh, because of this kind of thing. Hopefully, a deep reflection will take place. Have you paid attention to like Amber Ali Frost? Some of her stuff, like she's talking about some things right now that I think we kind of need to talk about in Spain. Um, and just around, around the European left right now in general. She talks about like different types of pathologies, you know, or she calls them different types of perverts in the left or whatever. And I love it um, because she's, she's right. It's like, is there's the people that are like masochistic is the people that are like, she calls them pedophiles, which was just kind of like people that are like, oh, the youth will save us, you know, this kind of thing. And then the third, which are kind of like the, I forget what, it's like the nostalgics, I guess, or something like that. Um, which I probably would fall into the most, but but um, but I think it's a very interesting take, and I think we're seeing all of that happen right now. Um, and and it's kind of an interesting time. So you know, there's very strong housing mobilizations taking place. They have taken place, and they will continue to take place in Barcelona, in our own fair city, uh, Tiare. I hope to see you there. The, and and the hurricane, well, the hurricane, the Dana. The storm in Valencia, which has left now 73 dead. Um, these are are real problems um, that go beyond the, the I'm not saying that that sexual aggression and sexual abuse on the part of any of their opponent is not a real problem, it's a systemic and structural problem. But at the moment that affects a political party at this stage in the conversation, the rest of the stuff we've been talking about for many years, and I think we know. Um, but but the the questions we've been avoiding dealing with or the housing question 
uh, climate change. And those two intertwine dramatically in what we're seeing in Valencia today. There's no reason for today it's 73 people to have died uh, because of the storm of this, this of these dimensions. I'm from Houston, Texas. I lived Hurricane Harvey, the largest rainfall event in the United States history. My house was destroyed with us in it, my whole family in it. It was devastating. These are man-made climate disasters that are very much the real danger of the capitalist scene um, and and this push towards uh, you know new uh, energy and climate oligarchs and housing and you know uh, landed oligarchs trying to trying to control the territory. Hopefully, we'll start talking about these issues a little bit more than whether Inigorrejon is like a Patrick Bateman, right? Right. Yeah, I think step one in 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 that camp would probably to be to yeah, like you said, because there are some concerning things and others that are sorted curiosity. I think most important first step would be to separate that and stop blending them. And then obviously to realize where the, the majority, the working class uh, that make up the majority uh, need to put their organizing behind. And that is what I wanted to ask you to try to leave people with a little bit more hope because for many who initially supported Vias and supported Sumar and maybe had some enthusiasm. That enthusiasm seems to be fading. And truly, after this week, it's probably not at a great point. What is your opinion in terms of hope on the left in Spain? Uh, where do you see that possibly being uh, put? Where can it be useful to put that energy? Are there any specific figures? movements or even uh, yeah just venues for working class organizing and leadership that you have any faith in right now the book i wrote on spain was called hope is a promise it was a sort of an inside joke to myself which are the worst kind of jokes because you have to explain them i just thought it was funny that it sounded like the title to like an obama book but there is a trick to it which is hope is only a promise and it is ultimately a form of delegation of responsibility, of delegation into the future. It's like, if only we can gather these actors uh, together, then we can make the moves and take control over our own lives, right? Or not necessarily control, but, but take the reins uh, and guide our own lives and, 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 and take ownership of our own collective decisions. And I, I wrote at the end of that book that the most interesting moments in Spain during the high point of mobilization that created the conditions of possibility and the structure of political opportunity that new actors emerged in and you know things did change uh, as a result of, those moments came when people abandoned all hope and organized their needs. I think that's what it comes down to. Where can you do that today? The tenants union, the tenants movement, the housing movement in general, the trade union movement. CGT uh, in Spain, the anarcho-syndicalist movement is, uh, you know, relevant in this country and uh, key in many important strategic sectors of the economy. But even, you know, joining organizations like Comisiones Obreras, the mainstream trade unions, UGT, whatever, whatever the union is where you're at, join it, transform it, build it up. And that's really the only place where we have class power, that and at the local level and in the streets. You know, unionism, just to kind of put a bow on it, Unionism, you don't have to wait for there to be a union to, pr to participate in unionism. Uh, the, street, the street vendors union is inspiring in this regard. You know, they're not even recognized as legal citizens by the state, but they take ownership of their work, of their labor, and uh, have become a key political actor in this city and in this country. And if they can do it, you, know, you can too. Absolutely. I very much agree. I think... Uh, obviously, this is not a good time for parties. Um, sadly, it's actually a very bad moment for Spanish institutional politics, but the unions are there. And I mean, there's again, that does need also a whole other podcast. <laughs> there are many issues with them, but they're there. And in order to transform them, we have to join them, probably, uh, I would think. So let's all do that. Eh? If any, like hope is also made 
as an action and and i truly think that's yeah. simply the answer at the end of the day and yeah that was basically what we wanted to talk about at a moment of hopelessness and darkness for sure especially given what's happening in uh, valencia but yeah in a country that's definitely in a in a very complicated and intense uh, political point right now yeah absolutely thank you so much uh, carlo muchas gracias uh, thanks everyone as well for joining us today uh please subscribe please do let us know if there's anything that you'd like us to discuss or anyone that you'd like to see us interview carlos i hope we'll have you back at some point for sure thanks so much for having me i'd love to come back